All right, take two. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the relaunch of Justice Power. We're so excited to have you here to learn from our new member orgs and to dive back into this incredible project that we've been compiling over the past year or so. And I, with that, I will pass it over to Joshua. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Alejandra. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are thrilled to have you today. My name is Joshua Medina. I am a part of the team at Justicia Lab. And we at Justicia Lab build digital tools for immigrant justice. And we're here today, thanks to our program, which is called the Immigration Advocates Network, hosting this webinar with our incredible panelists and facilitators. So just thank you all for being here with us today. Of course, we will post uh, a recording and materials online to the Immigration Advocates Network website uh, following the presentation and would like to welcome you all to please put your names, your pronouns, and where you are in chat just to get us started. There will be a Q&A box for you to use as well to ask questions and we are looking forward to engaging with all of you. Thank you. Sorry, folks. Okay. All right. So again, I'm Alejandra Torres. I'm the Legal Empowerment Fellow at the Bernstein Institute. And Gabriela. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, and my name is Gabriela. I am the program manager at the Bernstein Institute. Um, and so just before we get started and introduce Justice Power, what is the Bernstein Institute? Who are we and what do we do? Um, so we are a center housed at NYU School of Law. Uh, we are the only legal academic institution or center in the US um, that's focused on advancing um, advocacy, education, and research on legal empowerment here in the US and globally. Um, and really, we're just a small group of people that are really deeply committed um, to this belief that communities and individuals should be the um, like the leaders of their fight for justice. Um, and so all of our work engages with legal empowerment, um, which is a rights based methodology that originated in the global south. Uh, that seeks to democratize the law and center people in their own fight for justice. And it does this through um, the cycle of knowing the law so that folks can then use the law to shape the law and ultimately transform the law. Um, and so today we'll be talking about legal empowerment in the context of immigration um, and how folks that are um, engaging how, like how folks are engaging with legal empowerment in the context of immigration, specifically here in the US. Um, and so back over to you, Alejandra. Before I talk a little bit about justice power, we wanted to ask you folks to answer some poll questions. Yes. Yes. Do you want to provide information? Thank you. Sorry for that. Okay. So we have some poll questions. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty. And so all of the questions are in the same poll. Um, so we'll, we'll give you folks a couple of minutes to go through that. Um, Joshua, if you could please launch the questions. So the first question is uh, just what is your role? What is your role in this movement? Are you coming into it as a lawyer? Are you coming into it as an organizer? Uh, or do you engage with the work in a different capacity? Um, the second question, Joshua, I'm not sure if you've been able to launch it. I don't see it on my screen. Yep, sorry, they are launched. Uh, I can okay. read off the second question for you if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we have a bunch of you already chiming in. 51% have already answered. Uh, the second question is, with what strategies do you engage in your work? Check all that apply. And the options are accompaniment, community-driven campaigns, community-driven litigation, community paralegals, community well-being, conveners, hotlines, know your rights and popular education programs, pro se legal clinics, and tech justice. Perfect. And then the 
last question is a, a bit of a fun question um what is a, well, like what color do you associate with the word empowerment um so when you think of that word what does it bring up for you um and if it's not a color if it's just a feeling definitely feel free to write that in as well also sorry folks we hear that the chat is disabled we're trying to figure that out shortly apologies if people wanted to start engaging and could not yeah we'll work on that right now thank you for letting us know Okay, Gabriela, we put up the results for you. I'm I'm not sure if you can see them, uh, if you want to talk through them. Yes, thank you. So I can't see the response for the last question. I'm not sure if you're able to, um, but we can go over the first couple. So uh, who is, or what is your role? Who's in the room with us today? So we have a pretty big mix. We have a lot of lawyers. We have some community paralegals, a couple of advocates and some accredited reps. Um, and then we also have folks that are engaging uh, in the work in a different capacity. And then for the second question, uh, what strategy do you engage in your work already? Um, a lot of folks are doing Know Your Rights and popular education. We also have some folks doing community paralegal programs, uh, folks engaging with community-driven litigation. And it seems like tech justice and hotlines are, are the least engaged with. And so hopefully um, through engaging with Justice Power, you will uh, learn about other orgs that are engaging with that and then possibly implement it within your own community. Um, and what are folks excited to engage with more often? Uh, a lot of people are interested in pro se legal clinics. Um, and there's a bit of a tie between community paralegals and community well-being. And so uh, community well-being is actually one of the new strategies that we've added to the website. And so uh, really excited for folks to learn about that more and uh, see how it could become uh, central to some of the, the other strategies that you're already engaging with. Um, and for what color do you associate with the word empowerment? I can't see the answers, but I... If anyone else can see the answers, I would be excited to know what um, folks associate with the word empowerment with. I think of yellow personally. Um, so for anyone else that said yellow, yeah, I feel you. Um, uh, and yeah, it, Gabby, I can actually uh, access the answers here. Oh, cool. So we have we are seeing a majority of a good mix, actually. Uh, a lot of people said gold or yellow. Uh, we did hear some blue, green, red pink and bolded purple. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, okay, Alejandra, over to you. That's awesome. Well, Justice Power is in orange, so hopefully it aligns with folks who said uh, gold. All right, so some background on Justice Power. Justice Power first as an idea was born in 2018. Um, while uh, it was hosted, it was there was a hosting by Bernstein, UNHCR, the Global Justice Clinic, and folks got together and wanted to basically document legal empowerment strategies in the immigration context. And so what came of the idea was Justice Power, this website. It first officially launched in 2020, of course, the pandemic hit, and so some things were a little bit um, stalled, but as we know, uh, the legal landscape has changed completely. It keeps evolving. Immigration policies policies are constantly changing, are increasingly draconian, and we realized we needed to relaunch it to respond to these um, issues. Now, a lot of organizations were also reaching out to Bernstein, asking to for further engagement, new organizations, existing or organiza organizations, looking for more resources. And so we wanted to... Um, make justice power useful to folks. And so this relaunch now hosts over 12 new organizations, new resources, new strategies, and we're so excited for folks to engage with it. So we've been researchers, we've been talking to people, we've been coders. So it's been, it's been quite a ride and we're so excited to have new orgs with new uh, member orgs with us today, highlighting some of their strategies. 
So this is a website you'll see um, the different, the 10 strategies we have. At the very bottom, you'll see the organizations that are highlighted. There's over 20. You can click on the specific strategy if you want to see which organization is doing what. So for example, if I were to click community paralegals, you see the organizations. Over on the sidebar, you can see what is legal empowerment, the different strategies, the 10, the organizations, as you can see, there's plenty, and the resource library. So for example, one new organization we realized was important is community well-being. So we spoke to organi new organizations who implement different, different programs that cater to the health and well-being of their com the communities that they serve. We can't really you know, realize the full cycle of legal empowerment of knowing, using, and shaping the law when people's well-being and, and immediate needs are not addressed. Also, in tandem with that, if the uh, staff who are assisting and working with communities are not cared for either, then it's difficult to be able to achieve change. And so how does the website work? So usually you'll have the explanation of the strategy. You have examples of the strategy in action. So for example, you see Orange County Justice Fund, who, whom you will hear about later. And each organization kind of addresses a problem. And then you see the example of how they implement the strategy. It's also offered in Spanish. Hopefully, we will add Haitian Creole in the future. So you can see how it works. It does the translation. We move back. And we have resources. So if you click on a strategy, for example, community-driven campaigns, um, apologies for being a little slow. At the very bottom of the website of the page, after you see, see all these incredible things that organizations are doing, and now you're interested, okay, how do I go about implementing this strategy? You'll have the resources. And um, one resource, one new resource that we created are how-to guides. So I'm gonna pass it over to Gabriela so you can see what the guides look like. We did this in partnership with new orgs, old orgs, to really make it more practical to implement a certain strategy. So you'll see here at the top banner. Um, second, here we go. All right, Gabriela, over to you. Amazing, thank you. Um, so yes, before we go over the guide, so just, um, as Alejandra mentioned, Justice Power launched in 2020, and it's been really incredible to see um, some wins since then, to see how folks are really engaging with the website and what has come from that. Um, and so about a year and a half ago, I think, uh, Bernstein participated in a roundtable conversation with Orange County Justice Fund and a couple other organizations. And uh, in that, we talked about legal empowerment broadly, but we also talked about justice power. And you'll hear more from them directly uh, later on. But from then, they went on to justice power. They looked at the webinars, the resources, learned how other folks were engaging with pro se legal clinics, and took that as a sort of uh, reference point or like guidance in the conversations that they were having with community members, with partners and really use that to develop their own pro se legal clinic. And so it's been it's been really awesome. And in that, and also in some of the, the questions we've received via email and the conversations we've engaged with uh, over the, the past year or so, we've really heard from folks this desire to have a how-to, like how to actually implement this strategy. What are some of the questions I should be asking? How can I assess and create a balance between my capacity and the funding restrictions that we have and the needs that community members are expressing. Like, how do we find a middle ground? And also, how do we do so in a way that um, really honors the strategy? And so we've developed these how-to guides uh, in partnership with organizations that we believe to be experts in uh, their respective fields and also in the uh, strategies that they engage with. And so accompaniment, for example, 
uh, was developed in partnership with organized communities against deportation based in Chicago. And we developed this guide on accompaniment. And so this is, uh, each guide is unique to the strategy and follows a different flow, but broadly they all go from the sort of big picture grounding, what are some of the grounding questions, uh, how do you assess the needs of community, what is your relationship to the community? How are you entering this community? Um, some of those questions. And then it goes into the logistics of how do you actually implement the strategy? What are some of the administrative needs? What are some of the logistical needs? Um, for accompaniment specifically, how can you assess the, the needs of somebody based on how they're going through the system. So for example, is this their first hearing? Have they been to immigration court before? Um, is this a single person or do they have children? And if they have children, how does that implement the type of support that they need? Like perhaps they'll need childcare or uh, support with transportation, all of these things. And so um, it really outlines it. And then it goes into some of the like assessment, reflection, wrapping, up like full circle moment and so um like what are some of the the learnings that you have from your first sort of engagement with the strategy how can you improve what feedback has community shared and how can we continue to build out this program in a way that uh, is sustainable and also uh, meets your short-term and long-term visions and so yeah we're really excited for these to be made public they're intended to be uh, download it, share it uh, with your network. Uh, they can be accessed through this Google folder. They also live in the resources tab of the Justice Power website. And so, yeah, really excited to develop more. We're hoping to also launch them in Spanish in the coming months. And um, Justice Power is really intended to um, support legal practitioners, community organizers, and also provide some sort of uh, language and, and foundation to make the pitch to funders and to other folks uh, that can actually sort of help develop these programs and explain what legal empowerment is and how it's useful. And so we're really excited to have a practical guide and uh, yeah, welcome your feedback and also hope you engage with it. And so to hear from our first organization, our first community partner, it's uh, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and we'll be he hearing from Sion. Um, so over to you, Sion. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sion Germu. My pronouns are she, her, eswa, and I am the legal director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, BAJI, the first and largest national Black immigrant rights organization in the US, and also a very proud abolitionist organization working to combat the deportation and criminalization of Black immigrant communities. Every day, our office fights against the devastating impact of criminal and immigration laws that disproportionately punish Black non-citizens. We consistently see that immigration enforcement disproportionately affects Black immigrants, yet mainstream media and policymakers continue to frame immigration as a non-Black issue, leading to the erasure of Black immigrant communities. Additionally, we've noticed that our comrades in the immigrant rights movement have by and large left the need to confront policing and incarceration to Black people. Um, that is until this moment where we're witnessing a pretty seismic shift in language and ideology around policing and detention in this country due to um, what's been generations of tireless organizing work by Black, Indigenous, and other folks of color to dismantle systems that perpetuate white supremacy. This shift in ideology is also no doubt in part due to the increase in visibility of um, DHS's anti-Black violence at the border and in the interior, as well as the growing number of complaints seeking to uncover anti-Black violence that's taking place much less visibly within detention facilities across the U.S. So it's really critical that as a movement of immigrant, 
immigrant rights activists that we share the collective responsibility of confronting racism in our immigration system as a starting point. And at Baji, we recognize that that work cannot be led by lawyers. Rather, it must be a collective cross-disciplinary effort that empowers community members to guide our advocacy work. This is why Baji was formed as a collective of Black folks, mostly directly impacted immigrants, who work in areas of law policy, organizing, civic engagement, and communications to collectively improve the conditions of Black communities by advancing racial justice and migrant rights. Even when we pursue litigation, um, which we acknowledge as one very imperfect advocacy tool in our tool belt. We recognize the limitations of that legal work and the necessity of working in partnership with community to engage in more meaningful problem solving, um, which involves the incorporation of non-legal tools and advocates. By looking at our work in a legal empowerment frame, um, as Justice Power does, we understand that we always need to work alongside other non-legal folks who can help us problem solve more effectively, and that includes any litigation matter that we take on. Um, to that end, I'd like to introduce one example of Baji's community-driven litigation that we will explore today. So we will be engaging in a discussion on non-traditional litigation strategies and how the US government deployed an immigration enforcement agency to quell protests demanding racial justice. So we can move to the next slide, which just covers our agenda for today. So I am going to explore Baji CBP FOIA litigation as one example of community-driven litigation that perhaps um, we can share um, learn uh, the learned sort of outcomes from that project um, and think about ways to implement some legal empowerment strategies and um, future litigation that groups here may be engaged in. So to start off this conversation, we'll start by talking about the context behind this litigation. What was happening in the United States that led us to um, engage in this FOIA lawsuit? We'll also discuss the benefits and challenges of obtaining the records. We'll discuss briefly the report findings, and then we'll talk about continuing work on equity and combating global anti-Blackness as a cross-disciplinary effort. So to our next slide, Let's begin with um, contextualizing this FOIA litigation. The protests following George Floyd's murder in 2020 were rooted in a very long history of racial injustice and police brutality against Black Americans. As many of you know, Floyd, a 46-year-old Black man, died after a white police officer knelt on his neck during an arrest in Minneapolis. Video of the incident sparked outrage and really reignited longstanding grievances about systemic racism in law enforcement and society at large. The protests began in Minneapolis, which is one of um, the geographic areas that Baji works in and quickly spread across the US and globally. And this is part of you know, the broader Black Lives Matter movement. This movement gained momentum in previous years following um, the killings of Mike Brown, Eric Garner, and Breonna Taylor. Um, Baji's former executive director, Opal Tometi, who now goes by Ayo Tometi, is one of the three women founders of BLM. As such, Baji's entire team, particularly our organizers, have been deeply engaged in BLM organizing work um, before, during, and after the 2020 summer protests. Our organizers called for accountability um, an end to racial profiling and excessive use of force, and to abolish the police. The scale and intensity of the protests were unprecedented in recent U.S. history, which really reflected the deep-seated rage and resistance towards persistent racial inequalities in various aspects of Black life, which intersect with criminal justice, education, health care, and economic opportunity, just to name a few. 
the police response to these protests was excessively forceful, as many of us saw and witnessed firsthand. In numerous instances, law enforcement used tear gas, rubber bullets, and aggressive crowd control tactics against largely peaceful protesters. This approach was clearly reinforcing the very issues of police brutality that demonstrators were protesting against and further intensified tensions. We can go to the next slide. The historic massive mobilization Baji's organizers contributed to in 2020 forced the country to contend with the truth that we cannot address systemic racism without confronting the police. However, the government responded to that call by sending more police to our protests, this time utilizing a really unexpected agency, um, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Local organizers and media reports in June 2020 exposed CBP's role in policing protesters, and the public began to understand the extent to which CBP an agency many believed was confined to border enforcement, deployed personnel, aerial surveillance, and other federal law enforcement resources to cities around the country. CBP personnel also utilized unmarked vehicles to remove and detain protesters without identifying themselves. Due to the concerns expressed to Baji by the organizers and civic engagement folks we work with, in the summer of 2020, Baji, the American Immigration Council, and other groups filed a Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, request to seek information and documents about CBP's role in law enforcement responses to the racial justice protests. The scope of our request was really formed by the interests, concerns, and experiences of the community organizers we worked with. Also, we chose FOIA as our strategy in this instance because it would allow our legal team to really be led by organizers and civic engagement folks who knew precisely what information they were looking to access through FOIA and simply needed the support of lawyers to gain access to that information. This allowed us to work in a legal empowerment frame by passing on the power that exists within the legal system, in this instance, specifically FOIA law, to the organizers on the ground who could identify the issues and problem solve more effectively than the lawyers on our team could alone. As a result, the organizers led us to request information on records regarding CBP's deployment across the U.S. in June and July of 2020, specifically at protests following the killing of George Floyd. Uh, we also sought records reflecting policies, protocols, and instructions and or directives outlining CBP's legal authority to police and surveil at those protests. We also sought data, um, including the total number of CBP personnel deployed by field office and or by sector, um, the number of individuals apprehended, arrested, or removed by CBP, the immigration status of those individuals, um, including whether the individual was a U.S. citizen, and the basis for CBP's enforcement action. In October 2020, after CBP failed to respond to our FOIA request, um, Baji, the council, and our partners filed a FOIA lawsuit. Again, the scope of the lawsuit was framed by the organizers we were working alongside. And as we began receiving productions, non-legal staff, including um, organizers who helped form the initial FOIA requests, were included in the process of reviewing the productions. We did this because the organizers were the energy behind filing the requests in the first place, and they knew what we should be looking for in the productions. Additionally, after reviewing the productions, our organizers decided we should develop a web report that would allow other organizers across the country to access the productions that we received online. As a result, we developed a web report titled Beyond the Border, U.S. Customs and Border Protection Presence at Racial Justice Protests in Summer of 2020. It's very on the nose, like exactly what we were looking at. Um, the web report was the product of a multi-year cross-disciplinary investigation that sheds light on the extent of CBP's involvement and their use of abusive enforcement tactics during the 2020 protests. 
This report confirms what our organizers long suspected, um, which is that CBP often got involved in policing protests without being invited or asked by city or state officials, and its actions went far beyond um, their authority. Let's jump to the next slide. Before we delve further into, oh, I think the slide before that. Who is Customs? Oh, I'm sorry, you were right. Okay. Who is Customs and Border Protection? Thanks. Before we delve further into the findings of our FOIA litigation, it's really important to understand who CBP is. Um, for most folks, CBP conjures up images of a law enforcement body that operates near the border or at international airports in the U.S., but we've learned that they play a far more complex role in policing. So we must start by first acknowledging that CBP is one of the world's largest law enforcement agencies agencies and has repeatedly generated attention for its flagrant lack of transparency and countless violations of civil and human rights, including numerous examples of CBP encounters leading to civilian deaths. I would encourage folks to access more information about the legacy of racial discrimination within CBP because it is a very long legacy um, by checking out the American Immigration Council's report, um, The Legacy of Racism Within U.S. Border Patrol. Um, I'll also drop that link in the chat. Um, some highlights from that report are included on this slide. And we can go to the next slide. So where does CBP operate? CBP typically operates within a delimited zone of action under which those within the zone have a diminished constitutional right. The zone of action extends up to 100 miles inward from any land or sea border. So this means that two thirds of the US population lives in the border enforcement zone. Clearly, such an expansive jurisdiction is completely unnecessary and resource depriving, and it also creates ample opportunities for abuses of power. In response to the racial justice um, protests of 2020, CBP was deployed not to enforce laws within this already expansive zone of action, but pursuant to federal law and um, President Trump's executive order protecting American monuments, memorials, and statues, um, and combating recent criminal violence. Um, and so that executive order was later rescinded by President Biden. But under federal law, DHS secretary has the power to designate parts of DHS to assist in the protection of buildings, grounds, and property that are owned, occupied, or secured by the federal government. While CBP and other federal agencies were deployed throughout the U.S. under the guise of just protecting federal property and monuments, our organizers witnessed that CBP almost always went beyond this mandate. For example, during their deployment in Portland, CBP decided to take a more proactive approach and um, accused folks and arrested folks for violating laws that had nothing to do with federal pro property, including alleged assault of a federal officer and resisting or impeding a federal officer. Further, documents showed us that enforcement actions included um, assisting with crowd control, responding to requests for less lethal munitions, um, and general law enforcement, all of which, again, had nothing to do with protecting federal property. The entire situation illustrates how CBP's expansive jurisdiction can be extended well into the interior of the U.S. beyond any reasonable distance for immigration control. Let's go to the next slide. As I mentioned before, the lawsuit sought to compel CBP to release records and um, further public understanding of CBP's participation in law enforcement efforts during the domestic protests. And we were also seeking data to understand the impact of CBP policing on individuals in the form of apprehensions, deportations, and other legal actions. The documents we received through this litigation really deepened our understanding of CBP's role and function in the protests, as well as how they operate as an agency more generally. 
from COINTELPRO during the civil rights movement to most recently um, countering violent extremism under the Obama administration, the U.S. government has used surveillance to create havoc in justice movements. The secrecy of these government operations leaves protesters, particularly Black folks, vulnerable to criminalization. By obtaining these records from CBP, we were able to demonstrate to the rest of the world what minority and immigrant communities have known for a very long time. CBP uses violent, inhumane tactics in pursuit of its goals, which now included quashing local racial justice organizing work, all of which goes far beyond its legal authority. Let's go to the next slide. There were also um, a number of challenges in obtaining records through the FOIA process. Firstly, just the sheer amount of time that this process took in terms of waiting for the records to arrive, as well as litigating the delays. Um, this all made the entire process very drawn out. Um, Baji also had to contend with the substantial number of redactions within the report. This meant that we had to develop the narrative of what the record showed without seemingly vital pieces of information. Baji received nine productions in total from CBP and relied on support from all of the staff involved, again, largely non-legal staff, to review the documents. There was a lot of material to comb through, so in collaboration with the organizers, we used a shared spreadsheet to capture potential evidence within the production. Um, and then we tried to identify instances in which the agency's search was inadequate. For example, if an email mentioned an attachment and we didn't get the attachment, as well as maybe any reference to documents that were not actually in the production, then we track that as evidence of non-responsiveness. Um, for example, that means that there may have been outstanding records or the agency may have just missed something um, in its search. So we tracked the redactions as well, um, of which there were many, and noted documents that could be materially significant to demonstrating that CBP violated its purported legal authority or otherwise acted unlawfully. Um, this also included notating other things like clear evidence of racist sentiment. You can go to the next slide. The FOIA records document CBP's presence in many U.S. cities, ranging from D.C. to Portland um, to Buffalo, New York. Um, and I really encourage you to check out the web report, and you can search um, by specific locations. Um, for example, they were even deployed to George Floyd's funeral in Pearland, Texas. Um, the documents show that CBP often got involved in policing protests without being asked by city or state officials and that its actions, again, went beyond the purported mandate of um, protecting federal property. CBP officials themselves were concerned that its agents did not possess the appropriate crowd control, training, and equipment to directly interact with the public. We were also really disturbed by the militaristic language used to describe their role. For example, describing operations as battle rhythms um, and saying operations in Portland had no end in sight. Um, we we're also disturbed by the lack of knowledge within the agency that CBP was even playing a role in local policing and the enormous resources that were spent to send federal law enforcement to quash Black organizing, including deploying predators or B drones. These drones were flown over Minneapolis protests um, in efforts to identify and intercept um, potential terrorists and illegal cross-border activity. Um, as part of their surveillance of protesters in Portland, um, CBP even went as far as to obtain detailed discussions among protest organizers discussing safety plans and protest strategies in encrypted messaging chat rooms. You can go to the next slide. 
in recent years, we've witnessed a significant shift in approaches to policing and immigration enforcement with a growing emphasis on the sort of high tech measures I just described. This trend has manifested in the increasing use of advanced technologies such as biometrics, remote video surveillance, drones, and really sophisticated information technology systems. These tools are being deployed under the guise of enhancing border security and streamlining immigration processes. However, it's really crucial to recognize that the implementation of this level of policing enforcement and technologies is not occurring in a vacuum. They are being introduced into systems and societies already marked by deep-rooted racial inequalities and biases. This context is really essential for understanding the real-world impacts of um, this increase in enforcement and so-called technological advancements. We've seen concrete examples of this in recent history. Um, as I outlined during these protests of 2020, CBP deployed surveillance drones over Minneapolis ostensibly um, to identify and intercept potential terrorists and illegal cross-border activity. Um, and this use of military-grade technology against peaceful protesters exercising their First Amendment rights is a stark example of how these tools can really be weaponized against communities of color and those advocating for racial justice. Moreover, CBP's actions went beyond aerial surveillance. In Portland, um, CBP CBP did, as I mentioned before, obtain detailed discussions among protesters from encrypted messaging rooms, um, which violated privacy and potentially has a chilling effect on free speech. This level of intrusion really demonstrates the vast and concerning reach of these surveillance capabilities when directed at racial justice movements. The scope of CBP's involvement in policing racial justice protests remains partially obscured due to the extensive redactions I discussed um, in the documents that were released through the FOIA request. This lack of transparency raises even more serious questions about the scale and nature of their operations, both past and future, and whether the full disclosure would reveal an unnecessarily militarized response to largely peaceful protests. We would argue, yes, it would reveal that. Um, given these realities, there's an urgent need to develop new and different global partnerships to combat these racial inequities and in enforcement. To this end, Baji's legal and organizing teams um, will be attending the Sixth World Conference on Remedies um, to Racial and Social Inequality to share the findings from this um, particular CBP FOIA litigation and also to strategize about building cross-disciplinary partnerships in different contexts to continue uncovering and addressing um, racial inequalities in immigration enforcement. And so I will stop there. I have my contact information um, on the next slide um, to check in uh, about any potential partnerships that folks may be interested in or to learn more about um, this particular example of community-driven litigation or other examples that Baji is currently engaged in. Thank you so much, Sian, for such a detailed example of community-driven litigation and the importance, too, of understanding how racial justice, immigrant justice, crimmigration are so important. And Justice Power is also trying to, to bring that to light in ways that we hadn't quite before and really showing the importance of having organizers and lawyers working together to bring truth to power. Um, and so... Do people have questions? I know that there was one question in the chat from Jacob Maddox. The question was, does CPB having general arrest authority mean that they are essentially general federal law enforcement officers who can make arrests for violations of any federal laws within the jurisdictional limits being discussed? I don't think that our FOIA litigation was able to obtain a clear response to that question. Um, and so this may be in part due to the redactions, um, but it's also due in part to some of the um, some of the laws, including the executive um, uh, the 
proclamation by um, President Trump that was in place at that time no longer being in place. Um, CBP does have the authority, as I mentioned before, to um, engage in arrests within the interior um, that are within that scope of authority that I outlined, the geographic scope of authority, as well as anything having to do with federal monuments. Um, but in terms of like whether they can make arrests for violations of any federal laws, I don't think that we have that answer. Um, and so I'm happy to engage further. So we are continuing to work with the council and sort of like a part two um, to the report that we've already put out. And we're happy to include any organizations who may be interested in like outlining the research questions that can guide that additional report. Thank you. I think one last question that maybe if you can give like a quick uh, summary response is just um, like how, oh, just kidding. We might move on to that question later. I'm more about like strategizing and lessons learned. Sorry. Thank you so much, Sian. Um, I guess we'll just move on to Tanya from Orange County Justice Fund. Hi, everyone. Um, and wow, that was an incredible presentation. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, thank you so much for that and for your work. Um, but hi everyone, uh, and thanks for having me. My name is Tanya Leon, and I am the program coordinator at the Orange County Justice Fund. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little about a little bit about our organization, the pro se legal clinics we run, why we started them, and hopefully some practical tips for how you can launch or support similar programs in your own communities. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is our agenda for today. I'm going to start off with an introduction to OCJF, including our history and the local political context in which we we started, because that really guides our programming. Um, and then I'll get into some preliminary steps for starting pro se legal clinics with insights from our own journey. And then I'll end with a summary and hopefully some time for Q&A. And then uh, yeah, so by way of introduction, uh, OCJF is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, based in Orange County, California, and we're focused on supporting immigrants and refugees facing detention and deportation. Um, our goal has always been to ensure that people have access to effective legal representation to advocate um, and uphold for due process rights and assist with community reintegration. Next slide, please. Um, to understand our programs and the eventual addition of pro se legal clinics, it's important to know our history and Orange County's political drop backdrop. So OC has historically been a stronghold for anti-immigrant policies and figures, politicians. Um, but in 2017, we began as a volunteer effort to support detainees who were held at the three immigration detention centers within our county. So at that time, we were a collaboration of attorneys, professors, and grassroots leaders, and our initial response involved a lot of local volunteer advocacy. So we would start by visiting detainees, conducting legal intakes, assessing their needs, both legal and non-legal, connecting them with resources, and continue to advocate for their rights and the closure of those detention centers. Um, and we also launched our immigration bond fund in 2019 to further support folks who were detained. And now... Um, although we were eventually able to advocate for the closure of all three OC detention centers, we continue to uh, address issues of enforcement and inadequate care systems through all of our programs. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, other programs have evolved over the years to meet the changing needs of our community. Uh, one key program is our Cafecito Contigo program, which I saw was highlighted on the website, um, but it was created to address the well-documented negative effects of immigration detention, and that program brings together individuals from our bond fund and their families to offer support and healing. Um, and another significant initiative was our community fellowship program, which helped individuals build employment skills while also earning an income. Uh, still, we continue to face ongoing shifts in both the local and national immigration enforcement landscape. Uh, 
which has prompted us to continue to be creative and explore legal empowerment strategies starting in 2022. So key challenges in Orange County presently include um, that right after they closed the immigration detention centers, it was almost like a slap in the face that in 2021, they opened a new immigration court, uh, court in the center of our county. And on opening day, initiated close to 3,000 removal proceedings against OC residents. And we're currently, three years later, uh, nearly 17,000 OC residents are facing removal proceedings, over half of whom lack legal representation. Other challenges include that despite California sanctuary status, uh, sanctuary state status, um, many in people in our communities are at risk of transfer from jail to ICE, since our county sheriff department is one of the top contributors to ICE transfers in all of California. Um, and as you know, we'll disproportionately target in our communities it is Mexican and Vietnamese folks. Um, and another challenge is the increase in ICE's alternative to detention program, which has also caused significant difficulties for people released from detention and their families. So it's this context, these challenges, and the real stories from our community members and partners that underscored the need for better support systems and especially the need for accessible and reliable legal resources. So in 2022, uh, we did begin to implement proceed legal clinics as one effective strategy. Um, oh, we're there now. Okay. And I'll now I'll explain this approach and how it functions in our context. And hopefully I'll be able to provide some practical steps that organizers can take. Um, so starting off with a definition of both pro se and pro se legal clinic. Pro se refers to uh, representing oneself in court without a lawyer. Um, and a pro se legal clinic assists those self-represented individuals by providing legal resources, guidance, and non-legal help during a one-day event. Uh, with volunteers, including non-attorneys and interpreters who can who are supervised by attorneys or DOJ accredited representatives, uh, these clinics help individuals manage their legal needs, understand their cases, and overcome financial barriers to legal advice. Um, they're also you know, beautiful events that can foster empathy and community engagement as they bridge gaps in legal representation, especially for folks who may have complex cases that they just can't find help with elsewhere or those with limited access to other traditional services. Um, so you notice on the screen that pro se legal clinics can be structured in various ways. Um, on the slide, you'll see flyers for upcoming, very real upcoming clinics in our OC community that each have a different focus. So some offer general advice on cases or general um, advice on eligibility for relief, while others may concentrate on specific benefits like citizenship or DACA renewal. Um, which leads me to my next slide on what kind of grounding questions organizers should consider at the beginning of their decision and planning process. So uh, when developing these clinics, it's really important to have clear intentions and a strong focus on your own community's needs. Um, organizers should start by asking grounding questions about their goals and capacity. You wanna ask questions like, why do you wanna create this program? Who in your community will benefit? Where do they live? And how can you make sure that the program is accessible? What are their needs, both legal and non-legal? What kind of status do they have or don't have? What languages do they speak? You also wanna think about your own organization's capacity and your existing community connection. So maybe you don't have attorneys or DOJ reps on your staff, but who in your community can you partner with uh, to make sure that during these events, nobody is practicing the unauthorized practice of law? or vice versa, maybe you do have legal service providers, but you lack those community ties. So who, what grassroots organizations can you work with to build trust and credibility? Um, and importantly, you also wanna plan for how your clinic will gather ongoing feedback from the community to stay responsive and effective. Um, so at OCJF, we mainly work with individuals who've been released from immigration detention, many of which have prior criminal, uh, criminal convictions. So the initial legal clinics that we participated in and hosted were designed with these community members in mind. Um, we would get a lot of phone calls from them and say, you know, that they weren't able to find any legal representation or they found someone that they thought could help, but they, there was just too high of a financial barrier. 
Um, so in our county, there are some free assistance programs, uh, but there's often carved outs for marginalized groups like those with prior convictions. So in our case, uh, we started with those post-conviction reliefs uh, clinics where we would also assist with FOIA requests or general case assessments. And then now we also do naturalization clinics. Um, and then we also strategically hold or try to hold our clinics in the southern parts or the most northern parts of our county, given that that's where services are more scarce in our area. Um, I'll go to the next side. Okay. So you've asked yourself all these questions, and then you want to think through logistics of how you're going to host your legal, your pro se legal clinic. So it's super important to think about timing and location. Will it be a one-time event? Will it be recurring? Um, you want to make sure that you choose an accessible location and format, whether that be in person or hybrid, based on what best suits your own goals and your community's needs. Um, you also want to plan the practical details, including space, uh, equipment, and confidentiality measures. And you want to make sure that you think through a system that works for you and your community for managing sensitive information to maintain privacy and security. After um, contemplating those you know, considerations, then you want to think about building your clinic team, you want to identify the roles that you need. So is it attorneys, DOJ reps, paralegals, interpreters, admin support, and you want to decide what can be done by volunteers, what can be done by paid staff or both. As a tip, it's been helpful for us to clarify the roles and the expectations we have of our volunteers before we recruit them. Uh, that way we know exactly what we're asking people for. Um, and I also really want to highlight that you don't need to be an attorney or a DOJ rep to organize these clinics. So importantly, our team no longer has an attorney or a DOJ accredited rep on staff, but that hasn't discouraged us from continuing to host pro se legal clinics um, because we do have strong support from volunteer attorneys and from accredited reps in our community. Uh, which allows us to continue to meet the needs of people that we work with. Uh, next slide. Um, and since our clinic is a one-day event where attorneys or DOJ reps um, review intake forms, discuss options, and where volunteers sometimes assist with form completion while attorneys review the completed forms and provide next steps, but they don't typically sign G28s or offer uh, follow-up, uh, these are some of the key case management considerations that we have in mind when uh, developing a clinic, and all of these can vary depending on your own clinic-specific scope. But we do always begin with initial intake and assessment. Uh, whether your clinic accepts walk-ins or is by appointment only, this step might be completed before the clinic uh, even starts. Regardless, the intake process should always be thorough. You want to gather relevant details about uh, a person's immigration history and their criminal record. And depending on the clinic setup, volunteers might also use this time to review documents that were brought by participants to ensure that they have everything needed for a form completion later on in the day and so that attorneys or reps can provide a thorough case assessment. The role of volunteers and staff during this stage is crucial since intake interviews don't need to be conducted by legal representatives, uh, but it's important that you train your volunteers and your staff that are going to be doing this in trauma-informed care uh, because intake interviews can often involve sensitive information that could re-traumatize participants or could affect volunteers if they don't know, if they're not ready or if they don't know what to expect. Um, so it's helpful to give volunteers a script explaining that they're not legal representatives, that honest answers from participants will assist the attorney or DOJ rep with the assessment, and that volunteers will adhere to your clinic's confidentiality policy, uh, which you should have already established earlier um, during the grounding phase of the planning process. This is also a great opportunity to manage participant expectations by having them sign a non-representation agreement. Um, and you want to make sure that the volunteers can clearly communicate the scope of your clinic before uh, to the participants before beginning the process to make sure that the participants understand what services will or will not be provided. Uh, typically, the next step is for the attorney or the DOJ rep 
to review the intake form, provide an evaluation, and address any questions that the participant may have. As clinic organizers, it's crucial to convey to your volunteer attorneys and volunteer DOJ reps that pro se legal clinics um, goal is to empower participants by ensuring that they understand their case and can advocate for themselves effectively. So you want to make sure that your whoever you're bringing onto your clinic team understands this and can embrace that approach so that they can provide the experience that you envision for your clinic. Um, and then next steps are if your clinic focuses on a specific benefit, then the attorney should indicate whether the participant qualifies and whether volunteers should assist in filling out with relevant forms. Uh, during that document assistance stage, volunteers can help complete any necessary forms uh, while attorneys and DOJs ensure their accuracy. And again, really highlighting that uh, educational support is essential throughout the entire process. So you always wanna clearly outline um, the steps involved, what's happening, including like maybe how to submit forms if your clinic won't be doing that part and any self-help uh, resources that will be available to participants um, going forward during their ongoing efforts. Um, so resource referrals are really important. You always wanna offer information um, and additional resources and for services that participants might need, including non-legal resources. So that's a huge component of our planning process. We do like to invite uh, partner organizations and maybe have them table or just drop off whatever information they have. Um, and we always wanna keep in mind, again, that empowerment and community building are the priority. So each step of your clinic should reflect this ethos. And then finally, in the conclusion stage, you really just wanna focus on summarizing options reviewed with the attorney and address any final questions um, and taking these case management steps into consideration should help organizers ensure that the participants leave with, an understand, with a better understanding of their situation and the tools they need to proceed effectively on their own. So some example documents that you may develop or that you may find samples of on the new Justice Power website and you can use to make your own um, can include, for example, an intake form, a volunteer confidentiality agreement, non-representation agreement, know your rights cards or handouts, volunteer scripts, referral sheets, and much more. And we'll go to the next slide. So here, um, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of illustrate an example day of flow during a pro se legal clinic. This one in particular is for an in-person naturalization clinic. Um, and that kind of considers many of the points I discussed in the earlier slide. We find it super helpful to visualize the day of process and to share this with participating staff and with volunteers. Um, and with participants so that everybody knows what they can expect and what the next stage is on that day. And we'll go to the next slide. And some other considerations as you plan your pro se legal clinic are how you're going to engage with the community. Again, it's important to continuously seek feedback from participants and from the community members to adapt to the need that you're seeing. Um, I didn't include it here, but we also do have a hotline um, and that's what kind of informs what our next scope will be for pro se legal clinics. It's also important to uh, think about your community partnerships. You wanna build and strengthen relationships with other local orgs and with legal professionals um, to enhance your clinic's reach and effectiveness. As far as securing funding goes, uh, you wanna explore various funding sources. Um, if you work in a nonprofit, you know there's always ups and downs to uh, different types of funding sources, but you wanna include, for example, private funding sources, cities, funding and federal options. Um, in our case, our first pro se legal clinic, we received city funding because as part of our other week, other work, we also engage in budget advocacy at the county and city level. Um, pros and cons to that, you know, sometimes cities want to only support their own residents, but be creative essentially is what I'm saying in searching for funding. Um, you also want to make sure that when you promote your clinic, you use all the tools in your community outreach belt. So 
things like using your social media, having your local partners um, uplift your clinic, even we have gone to like local coffee shops and libraries and community centers, um, make sure everything is in the language of the folks that you will be engaging with. Um, you also always should uh, manage client expectations. So clearly communicate with folks that a proceed legal clinic is typically a one day event where the goal is for them to learn and ask questions, um, but it's not necessarily in no, it, it's not at all um, engaging in an attorney-client relationship. Um, and then training. Training is always important. You need to make sure that your clinic team is trained on confidentiality, trauma-informed care, and clinic procedures. And next slide, please. Um, finally, when it comes to measuring your clinic success, it's important to recognize that performance metrics may vary. Um, for us, the primary indicators of, of success are whether participants leave with a clear, clearer understanding of their options and their case and whether they know the next steps that they need to take and how to take them. So we found that in general, participants report increased knowledge of their legal rights and greater confidence in managing their cases. Many have also achieved other positive outcomes such as approved stays of removal, successful FOIA request, effective advocacy with our local police department for U visa supplement B certifications and post-conviction relief for some. And on this slide, there's just quotes from past participants and in the next slide, um, this is just a summary of everything I went over. Again, it's really just assess the needs and make sure that they are specific to your community and that they will be helpful to whoever it is that you plan on working with. You wanna make sure you plan with intention, uh, recruit your team with intention and develop materials that are accessible to your community, promote and then just launch and evaluate. So with that, um, here is my contact in case I can be helpful to anyone. And a note that the New Justice Power website has a lot to say on their how-to guide on pro se legal clinics and has a lot of sample documents of everything I went over. Uh, Gabby mentioned it, but we really did get the idea to do a pro se legal clinic based on the old Justice Power website. So I'm so excited that it will only it's only getting better. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Tanya. That was incredible. And thank you so much, Sian. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I know we didn't have time to do the questions that we had in the Q&A. Uh, so if Alejandro or Joshua, if either of you could please read some of those and facilitate that, because I don't have access to the Q&A, I would appreciate it. I'd be happy to jump in and do that for you. Yeah, thank you so much to folks for dropping questions in chat. I, I wanted to read out first and foremost, <clears throat> Rex asked a question about how non-lawyers felt about the FOIA litigation's outcome. And we had a response to that, which was that folks found value in being able to confirm their suspicions about CBP operating beyond its legal authority and we were also left with many more questions about what CBP's legal authority is or may be if future executive orders expand their reach. Uh, and this feels increasingly relevant in the moment when our organizations and civic engagement folks are engaged in strategic planning and risk assessment in relation to the upcoming election. Um, and we had a related question to that, which was touching on if we've had indications by either potential administration about prioritizing the abolishment of the geographical restrictions as well. Um, and, and I know we kind of touched on it in, in this question here. And as somebody who uh, has a Mexican family that the border crossed over and grew up uh, in the Southwest and then was in Portland for all of these uh, CBP issues, uh, marching and, and seeing it happening firsthand, uh, that was a fantastic overview. Again, just want to thank you both and want to throw out a selfish plug for folks to uh, Feel free to email me and check out whostclab.org if you are doing the kinds of clinics and workshops that Tanya was was talking about. Uh, if you want to learn more about different resources you might be able to use or tech tools, um, and 
I wanted to open it up, uh, Gabby and, and, and Alejandra, back to the both of you, because I know that we wanted to turn towards some questions about what mobilization could look like around these issues. And uh, that was the, the next big question that we wanted to hit. So, so thank you for that. Thank you, Joshua. Um, okay, so I guess we can combine some questions. And again, thank you both for your presenting um, your incredible work and also providing context for how this relates to justice power as a site to access ways to think about all these issues and then actually go about and implementing them and working across a diverse interdisciplinary pool of folks with different types of experiences, whether they're lawyers, whether they're organizers, whether they are accredited representatives. Um, so one question for both of you is, what does it look like to co-strategize? What are the strategies or tips you learned in co-strategizing? I imagine this means with non-lawyer folks in developing these types of strategies, oh, that's repetitive, these types of programs or um, lawsuits? Um, I'm happy to, to kick us off. I think in this particular instance um, and in other like similar FOIA lawsuits um, and other impact litigation, we are generally led by our organizers and the folks on the ground. Um, and so our co-strategizing sort of leads out of the initial requests that we receive um, from, in this instance, organizers and protesters who identified an issue, and they also identified how the attorneys could assist. And so we basically just followed their lead and taking the issues that they identified working that into a FOIA request and later into a complaint that was filed in district court um, and making sure that they were part of the process of both um, going through the productions when we received them and then determining how to utilize the productions as a tool moving forward. Um, I feel that in, in terms of like co-strategizing I'm not sure if this is like a strategy but having the lawyers take the back seat um, and sort of have folks on the ground guide the direction of the work is is the way that it played out um, similarly we're engaged in um, another FOIA lawsuit now that's looking at uh, detention conditions in the south um, and particularly the uh, mistreatment of black folks um, within those facilities. So again, there we're being led by folks in detention who know the harms that they and others have experienced within those facilities. We have not been present to see that. And even when we file CRCL complaints or FOIA requests, we're not able to obtain that information. That's the information that they hold. And so we have to be led by um, those folks who who know what is happening within the facility so that they can guide um, the the course of our litigation and the sort of documents that we should be looking for. Tanya, did you maybe want to, want to respond to? how you maybe you worked with community members to assess their needs and figure out which clinics would provide what information or what assistance? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, we were coming at it at a little bit of a different angle because we no longer have attorneys or DOJ reps on our staff. Um, and we started as organizers and advocates, which is still a large part of our work. Um, these pro se legal clinics are the newest part of our work, um, but they were developed because of the needs we were seeing um, from community members. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we have a hotline, our bond fund, um, folks that come out of our bond fund also really, uh, what is it, impact like our advocacy priorities. Um, because that's where we started. So in terms of co-strategizing with attorneys, we are so lucky to have a ton of support from volunteer attorneys in our community. And it's been very helpful to work with them and kind of ask them questions about 
how to go about the priorities that we're, you know, contemplating. So. Um, that was great. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that we get asked often is how do you find attorneys that are like down for this approach? Like how can you find folks that are willing to center community, um, to create space and like actively allow those that are impacted by the issues to be part of the strategizing and to like really lead like the the efforts and so how have you found that in your own work how have you approached attorneys um if you've ever had tension between communities and lawyers how have you navigated that and what are some of the learnings or tips that you can share with folks that's a great question um I feel again it's a little hard to answer just because we are so lucky um we started because of the context that there was three immigration detentions in Orange County, which is just a ridiculous amount. Um, one is a ridiculous amount. But so we started as advocates together. Um, so I feel like since our inception, we've been in relationship with, as you say, attorneys that are down for this movement. Um, I think also because we're an immigration bond fund, attorneys will also come to us to ask us to assist their clients. So I don't know that I have a lot to say um, if we existed in a community that that didn't start that way and that didn't already have that. But I will say for vetting attorneys, um, you should also be very mindful of sometimes folks will communicate to us that so-and-so at said place like did this. Um, so you should always, always kind of watch how, even how attorneys um, interact with community members. Like, there's a certain vibe, right? And you, you'll you know it when you see it. Um, so you should also keep that in mind when you are planning your clinics and then planning who you want to partner with. Uh, but yeah, again, I, I don't know how helpful that is because we just are so lucky in our area. Uh, yeah, I would just say that this sort of legal education that like budding attorneys and even like experienced attorneys receive like really affects the way that they engage with community. So we we prioritize partnerships with, with law school clinics that we know are helping form like the next generation of social justice attorneys who are really um have a client-centered, community-centered approach to their work. Um, and we try to make contributions within that space um, to make sure that they're also engaging in um, anti-racism work. And they're also working at the intersection of like racial justice and um, immigrant rights um, and LGBTQ rights and working on the issues that Baji, you know, prioritizes. Um, and so we try to make you know, contributions to like the legal clinic space in that way. Um, we also strive to partner with um, organizations such as Law for Black Lives um, and NIP and LG that are also committed to making sure that practicing attorneys are continuing to evaluate how they engage with community and being more meaningful um, and thoughtful about those interactions um, and are also willing to be to be led by the communities that they serve and looking at what that may look like, what that may sound like when working in um, different contexts. Um, I think that Bosch is also really um, committed to providing the sort of um, cultural competency training that um, are helpful for attorneys who find themselves working in um, a lot of different communities that they may not be that familiar with. And so um, we've done several trainings for attorneys who are interested in working with um, Black migrants at the border. We've done like specific trainings on like Haitian asylum claims and other um, types of claims that are specific to various like um, cultural and country conditions. Um, and so I think just being able to dedicate time in like your day um, and the agenda of your work to continue to support the growth of like our field and being as culturally competent and inclusive as we can be is like really important um, part of like Baji's like legal objectives. And so we try to contribute in whatever ways we can. 
Um, thank you. So we are coming to the end of the relaunch presentation. Um, and so just before we wrap up, we want to invite all of you to connect with us. Um, I'm just dropping in the chat um, the contact us page from Justice Power. And so if you are part of an organization that is interested in being highlighted on the website or you have questions about any of the strategies um, or if you're engaging with the website and you see you come across an organization that you would love to connect with and you're not sure you're not sure how to get in touch, um, feel free to reach out to us and we would love to connect with you. Um, we also invite you to check out the Bernstein Institute website and learn more about us and the work, the other legal empowerment work that we engage in um, and join our listserv so you can stay up to date on all things Justice Power, but also some of the other programs we engage in. Um, and Alejandra, over to you. Okay, we're almost done. <laughs> Once more, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Sion and Tanya for doing such an incredible job at highlighting the both the complexities of the of this work, but also um, so clearly speaking about how we are able to do this work and how important it is to do it, especially right now when things keep changing for immigrant communities. Um, so we just want to highlight that it is an evolving uh, project. And so we invite people to engage with it. Today's conversation demonstrated how now we're trying to be more diverse regionally uh, with the populations that are being served within the immigrant community. And so two things to look forward to, the how-to guides will eventually be in Spanish. We also know that UPL, the Unauthorized Practice of Law, is something that a lot of um, non-lawyer immigrant advocates are grappling with constantly. And so we will have more resources on that. So stay tuned. The Bernstein Institute is really committed to advocating for community justice workers, community paralegals, non-lawyer advocates who are doing this incredible work and in serving their communities, um, advocating for them and to be able to do this work without being penalized with vague and repressive laws like UPL. And so we also have an event in September, September 12th at 9 a.m. Eastern time related to that conversation. So with that, I thank everyone for joining us, for being a part of the network, hopefully, and have a great afternoon. And thank yeah. you, Jacqueline, for helping us organize this webinar. And we'll be sending out the presentation and the slides afterwards. Thank you, everybody.